It's happy to be here. So if we can just ask folks to mute their microphones and um, video and shut their video off besides the speakers, that would be great. And welcome everyone. So good afternoon. My name is Jenna Villani. I'm the Executive Director of Alumni Relations here at William Patterson University. And I'm, we're just delighted to have you here today for our webinar, No Resources, No Problem supporting early childhood families and educators with meaningful interactions with materials found at home. So No Resources, No Problem is a variety of developmentally appropriate activities that are linked to skills based on early childhood goals, objectives, and standards that have been field tested by the expert's very own toddler and can be implemented with materials found in and around the home. This session will provide families with several options and opportunities to have developmentally appropriate, entertaining, low to no cost, and low stress interactions with their children. It will provide teachers with a guide to enhance learning at home, as well as engage families in equitable, family friendly, in an equitable, family friendly manner. Uh, so this session is being offered in partnership by the Office of Alumni Relations and the College of Education at William Patterson University. And again, we're delighted to have you here today. So before we get started, I just want to um, go over a few details on how today's session is going to work. So again, upon entry, your microphones and videos have been turned off and we kindly ask that you please keep your microphone muted and your video off throughout the presentation. We welcome questions and want this to be an interactive session, so please feel free to type your questions in the chat box throughout the webinar. Um, please note that today's session is being recorded and will be available online on demand after the session. And just depending on your settings, you're probably seeing the presentation on your screen and this, uh, the speakers uh, on the right hand, right hand side of your screen. So just um, so you know you can move that around or minimize it if it's blocking the presentation for you and that's depending on your settings. And lastly, we'll follow up via email to share some uh, materials from today's program with the recording. So um, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'd like to introduce uh, Cindy Generelli, who is the Director of Early Childhood Education Innovation here at William Patterson University. And so it's now my pleasure to turn it over to Cindy. Hi everyone. Sivan? Yes. The screen? The yeah. power. Give me one second. Here we go. So, Whoops. It's my pleasure to be introducing the <clears throat> presenter. And Sivan is working with us at William Patterson as a professor in residence. She's working in two of our partnership districts right now. She is certified in early childhood and special education. She's um, completing her master's right now in special ed as well. She formerly was an inter, uh, integrated preschool teacher and a mentor teacher for 10 years. Um, as I said, she's a wonderful professor in residence. She's very much in demand by many of our districts. And she also works as a consultant for us. She's a trainer for Grow New Jersey Kids, and she, she definitely is a mom of a very energetic two-year-old. <laughs> and for the purpose of this workshop, um, her co-presenter is JD. He's her, um, her really, really her inspiration for this workshop is what I would say. And um, JD was born six and a half weeks early. He weighed three pounds, nine ounces. Um, he did graduate from the NIC unit after two weeks. Um, we were all holding our breath and cheering and reading, uh, knowing that, you know, he was going to be very healthy, and which he is. He is now very healthy, very friendly, um, and very energetic, and you'll, you'll see this throughout the presentation. And um, see, Yvonne does an amazing job of just keeping him busy and entertained, and learning has been a fun challenge. And this is how um, No Resources, No Problem was created. So um, hopefully everyone is enjoying their show. Um, I shouldn't say, well, it really is a show, Savon. 
Uh, as much as it's going to be a presentation, this is really a show just watching uh, JD and some of his videos. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, I think today, I hope everybody is, uh, you know, has, has electricity and is safe and good. Today is uh, definitely no resources, no problem. I still don't have electricity in my own house, so no resources, come to mama's house. She has electricity here for me, and uh, I was able to be with you this, this afternoon, so I'm glad to be here. Um, like Cindy said, um, my, my little boy was, uh, came very early, and we were a little concerned, um, but the minute I met him, I knew he was going to be feisty, I knew he was gonna have a lot of energy, and I knew he was uh, gonna do something special. And that he did. He is a very energetic child. And I always say uh, energetic in a way that there's toddler energy, there's boy toddler energy, and then there's JD energy. Um, so much so that he actually broke my nose uh, two weeks ago just by coming down a slide um, and knocking me the wrong way. I'm fine, he's fine, we're all fine, but that's that kind of energy that I'm dealing with. Um, who would have thought that back in March we would be in a situation where all of our entertainment and activities and things we love to do to keep our children busy are canceled or closed. Um, we couldn't even get toilet paper, let alone popsicle sticks or pom-poms or markers, right? Um, so I literally was grasping for straws, and you'll see that as we go through the slides, to keep JD busy. Um, it's been a challenge, uh, uh, but it's been a lot of fun. Quarantining with a toddler, we were able to bond very nicely um, and spend some time together that we wouldn't have spent together before. Um, but I had to learn to quickly uh, um, put activities together for him. Um, so I put my educator hat on really quickly. <laughs> and uh, as an inter uh, integrated preschool teacher and as a consultant, I have been trained to make most moments teachable and to link any interaction to a developmental goal or objective. Um, and to build on them. So I quickly began creating interactions to do with JD uh, to keep him motivated, but also to keep me sane, okay, right? Uh, because that's part of it too. Um, so for you, I've taken the guesswork out of it. I um, took the creating out of it. I've taken the research out of it. I've taken uh, the, uh, the work out of it. And basically I'm just gonna share activities, interactions, um, how to effectively implement these activities with your children or your students um, at home. So we're gonna discuss how to challenge children who need a challenge. We're gonna discuss how to modify for children who might need modification. Um, keep in mind, my son is two, um, but these activities can be modified or challenged for children who are older or developmentally not ready. Um, you're gonna notice that the emphasis is never on skill and drill. It's never on worksheets, um, but it's always on interaction. It's always on interest. It's always on play. It's always on building language um, because really that's the most important part. I feel like families often say to me, oh my gosh, how am I going to teach my child the ABCs and the one, two, threes and, and the shapes and the colors and, and out come the flashcards. And I'm here to tell you that there are so many different ways to do that that are fun and engaging for your, for your child. Um, so how's this gonna work? Um, I have broken down uh, these activities in large categories such as water play or math skills or uh, fine motor skills, so on and so forth. And under those uh, large segments are um, subcategories. And that's where I'm going to show you the um, interactions and the activity. After each segment, we'll stop for some questions or uh, clarification. Okay, so let's begin. So let's start with water play. It's summer, it's hot, right? Most pools are closed, most splash parks are closed, water parks. I just heard Sesame Place just opened. Um, but a lot of people are still nervous to go out and, and do those things, right? I don't have a pool at home, so what am I gonna do with my child? No problem. There are many ways to keep cool, stay entertained and foster development and skills at home. So let me show you them. Hose play, it's as simple as that, right? Um, most of us have some sort of hose or water source at home, that's all you need, right? A water source, buckets, cups, bowls, spoons. Um, and all you really have to do is let your child turn the hose on and off, believe it or not. Um, there's so much power in their hand when they can squeeze and let the water go and let go and the water stops, right? They're learning exploration. They're learning cause and effect, right? And they have a lot of power. <laughs> so take that hose and, and, and let them play with it. And while they're playing with it, as the adult, your job is to foster that language, right? Teaching them things like on and off, 
teaching them things like hard and soft, right? Teaching them words like, oh my goodness, when you squeeze, it turns on. And when you let go, it turns off, right? Things that may seem really simple to us, but to a toddler or a preschooler, it may be one of the first few times they've ever done that. Um, so it's as simple as turning that on and off. Filling and dumping containers, right? Um, what happens when we keep filling even though there's no room left in the container? What's going to happen? We're gonna teach questioning, we're gonna teach volume, science, curiosity, right? And that language of overflow, that might not be a word they know. Um, you can give them a sense of independence by taking that hose and watering the plants in the grass. Maybe that's a daily activity. Wake up in the morning and go outside and say, okay, these flowers really need water to grow. Let's go get our hose and squeeze it on and water our flowers, plants, and grass, okay? Painting with water. So often I say to, to parents or teachers or friends of mine, hey, give your children paint. And, and the reaction is, oh my gosh, what a mess, right? Um, when I paint with my son, it's usually, uh, I have to wash the clothes, I have to wash the surroundings, I have to wash the table, I have to wash everything because paint is everywhere. So here's a mess-free way uh, to do painting outside. Um, all you need is a variety of paint brushes, uh, maybe paint rollers, um, water, and some sort of surface, okay? Um, your deck, your porch, your uh, sidewalk, your, the side of your house, whatever works for you and your environment. Um, and you encourage creativity, imagination, and intending to a task by having them dip that paintbrush or whatever it is that you have in the water and let them be the painter, right? Uh, JD did this for like a good 20 minutes, which is unheard of for a two-year-old. Um, he really had a good time. Um, you don't have a paintbrush at home? No problem. That's fine. Uh, spray bottles work. Watering cans work. Get that hose again. That works really well. And when in doubt, grab a leaf and dip it in water and use that as your brush. Um, there's so many different ways that you can uh, modify. Um, is your child a preschooler or maybe uh, interested in letters, numbers, shapes, colors? Um, that's fine. It's a great challenge. Get a piece of chalk. Let's say we're working on shapes. Draw a triangle and a circle with your chalk and ask your child to dip the paintbrush in the water and erase the circle. Right? So now we're getting... Uh, um, they're learning to attend to a task, they're following directions, and they're following through with that paint skill that we've been working on. Still interesting and fun for them. Okay? You can do the same thing with letters, with numbers, with colors. Um, it's as easy as just drawing on the sidewalk and having them erase it. Okay, moving on. Soapy soak. So right now is a time where everyone's kind of a little more nervous uh, than usual about germs, right? We're washing our hands constantly. We're, we're uh, wiping down um, surfaces. Um, so what a great way to continue washing and cleaning and uh, uh, promoting hygiene than washing toys, right? Take as many uh, washable toys as you have. So maybe kitchen toys or um, manipulatives like pegs that are plastic or plastic blocks, um, things that can be wet. Um, and Throw them in a bucket of water with soap, get a rag or a sponge, and encourage your child to just scrub, right? Wash those toys with soap and water. They have so much fun doing it. They're building responsibility and independence, and they're engaged. They're making a connection to things that, that mommy or daddy or grandma or grandpa do at home, um, and they have a chance to do it themselves. Um, and then you let them dry. And once they dry, then you can work on classification so, or sorting. So let's take all of the kitchen toys and put them in one bin. And now can you find all of the plastic blocks and put them in another bin? And how about you find all the plastic pegs and put them in another, another bin, right? It's a way for them to um, practice classifying um, after they've done this really fun water activity outside. And it's really fun to pour it all over yourself when, you, when you're all done because it's just soapy water so it doesn't hurt anybody. Um, And then there's fountain play. Um, this, all you really need is empty bottles of any sort, water bottles, soda bottles, cans, and you need something sticky and a surface. So what I did was I took some water bottles, I cut the top, the bottoms off of some of them, and on some of them I cut kind of holes in uh, on the side. If you can see on the picture on the right hand side, it's hard to tell. 
and I lined them up on a fence and I taped them on so that they were able to pour into each other. What I like to do is put a container underneath it so that the water that he's pouring in will get caught, will all go in the container and then he can reuse the water again. Anyway, I asked him to take a little cup or a, you know, a, a container and pour the water in. He's learning curiosity and cause and effect just by watching how the water can go through those fountains. Um, and this is something that you can change around. So it's not working this way, great, let's make it work another way. So it's problem solving together. Hey, the water's spilling out, it's not going through the bottle the way we want it to. How can we change that together, right? So for those children who are a little older, who are ready developmentally to problem solve, you can do it together. My son is two, he wasn't ready to, to put it together himself, so I did it for him. Um, but I encourage them to pour the water through and watch it flow out. Um, you don't have, you don't want to use water, that's fine. Pebbles work, right? Acorns work in the fall. Um, Pom-poms are fine. Hard, uh, uh, dry beans work really well. Um, so th there's lots of uh, materials that you can pour. Anything that you can pour, you can use for this activity. So at this point, if there's any questions about water play, I'm happy to, to take those. Great, so just as a reminder, if you have any questions, you can type them into this chat box here. Um, I don't see any at the moment. Okay, so we'll wait a few minutes just to be safe. Yeah, so you can go ahead and type your questions if you do have any at this point, so um, we can address them. Okay, I'm not seeing any, so. Okay, great. Move on. Okay. All right, so moving on to playing within our own environment. So <laughs> running out of ideas is pretty easy when you're stuck at home for multiple days at a time. Uh, materials, it's pretty easy when you can't get to a store and Amazon isn't shipping quick enough. Um, <laughs> and resources and patience. No problem, go outside, use your ever-changing weather to your advantage. Um, I often say here from parents, oh my gosh, it's raining. What am I gonna do inside with my child all day long? We can't go in, go outside and play. I, I don't know what I'm gonna do. So here's what I tell you. Why isn't this going? Come on. Ah, go outside, go outside and enjoy that rain. If it's not thundering and lightning, get outside um, and don't be afraid to get wet. Um, there's so many awesome activities that you can do outside to A, entertain your child, B, um, keep them learning and stimulated and uh, building on skills that they, um, that, they, that they need. So of course, gross motor skills, running around outside in the rain is so much fun, right? Dodging raindrops, um, running in between raindrops, you know, all, all of those fun activities that children love to do. Um, stomping in puddles, exploring how high the puddles will splash, right? Um, you might want to observe a stick or a leaf floating down a stream of water into a sewer drain, right? JD's favorite activity is standing by the sewer drain and, <laughs> and watching things go down, right? Throwing rocks in there and seeing what happens. Um, not the cleanliest activity, but still fun nonetheless. Um, catching raindrops in your mouth, on your hand, in a bucket, right? Um, searching for earth earthworms. Um, and I say this to you, uh, Coming from a person who really is, gets a little skittish and skeevy about bugs, as a teacher, I had to quickly get over that <laughs> because if I'm scared, they're scared. And if I'm interested, they're typically interested. So when I was in the classroom, I would bring earthworms into the classroom every year for kids to explore and touch and play with. And I quickly got over my fear and saw that they were really interested as well. Same thing with my son and same thing with your kids. Um, if you show them that you're interested, they probably will be too. Again, they're learning things like gross motor skills, cause and effect, science skills, language. Your job as the adult is to, to build that language, right? Narrate the things that they're doing. Um, and I'm going to go into that in just a minute. They're learning distance and direction with where the water is going and how it's flowing. So on the top, you're going to see three pictures. The first picture is a picture of my son, um, with a leaf in a little stream that's going into a sewer drain. Um, and the ways that you can kind of cultivate the language is by saying things like, does this leaf move fast or slow, right? It's as easy as that. And then observing how it moves. Um, which way is it moving? 
um, let's test if a leaf or a stick will move faster and plop them both in there um, and see what happens. Uh, chase it down, chase it as it goes down the stream, right? Um, I wonder where all that water's going. Find where it's going and maybe sit and watch it. Again, we spent a lot of time near that sewer drain. Uh, the next question, the next picture is um, a, a earthworm. So we can watch how the earthworm moves across the ground. Maybe can you think of another animal that moves the same way, right? Um, do you move that way? How do you move? What do you use to, to, to move your body, right? Um, so now you're talking about comparing. Uh, what do you think the worm eats? So we talked a lot about how worms live in the dirt. And so uh, JD spent a lot of time digging up dirt and bringing it over to that earthworm, okay? Um, so that's just another way to, to talk about science skills. Um, and what does he feel like? If you're brave enough, touch him, right? See what he feels like and, and, and maybe pick him up and see how he slithers, right? Um, earthworms are pretty safe. They're not going to bite you. And the last picture is a picture of JD uh, stomping in the puddles, which is our favorite pastime. Um, what happens to the puddles when you stomp hard or soft or fast or slow? Can you make a big splash with your feet or a small splash with your feet? Right, so we're doing trial and error. Um, and can you try to catch, catch raindrops in your hand? Can you try to catch them in your mouth? Maybe get a cup or a bucket, uh, a big one and a small one, see which one fills up first, right? Make a prediction and see which one is gonna fill up first. Um, now, whenever we see rain, JD's first response is, let's get our rain boots and go outside, right? Uh, so, you know, we just had this hurricane and all he wanted to do was go outside and I thought, oh my God, I can't, uh, raining raindrops are fine, but dodging trees is another story. So we opted out this time, but um, uh, there's lots of ways to, to foster development and have an awesome time uh, in the rain. Mud Kitchen. This is another fan favorite in our house. Um, JD's grandpa happens to be a very uh, handy guy. And so he built a mud kitchen, which is essentially just a, uh, a, a wooden tool bench with a sink, right? But you don't need that. If you're interested in, in building one, there's a million uh, models that you can Google and put together, feel free. Um, but you don't need a mud kitchen to play in the mud. Um, playing in mud and making mud pies is one of uh, the best activities for a toddler or a preschooler to do to uh, foster so many skills and not to mention have an awesome time. So I say don't be afraid to get dirty. Um, this is like a safe place to get dirty right outside with the mud and just hose them down when you're done or throw everything in the wash and throw them in the bathtub. That's what we do at least. Um, so what do you need? You need pots and pans, you need cups, spoons, measuring cups, basters, whatever you have in the kitchen that you don't really care to get dirty. So I used old pots and pans and containers. Um, get a few things and bring them outside. You need dirt, water, grass, flowers, rocks, right? Um, gather the utensils and encourage your child to mix the dirt, the water, the grass, the rocks, the flowers together, right? If you want it to be a little more dry, encourage them to add more dirt. You want it to be a little more wet, encourage them to add a little more water. And now we're fostering those science skills, that trial and error, that uh, the cognitive skills, right? Um, play with them by pretending to cook something together, using language like measuring, pouring, mixing, stirring, right? Um, kind of pretending like you're, you're cooking in the kitchen. Uh, when we started doing this, a few hours later, we went downstairs in my basement to play in JD's play kitchen, and all he kept saying was mix, stir, sprinkle, right? Um, they use the language that you utilize with them. So here's just a quick video. Mmm, that looks delicious. What are you making? Making French toast. You're making French toast? What What were your ingredients? What'd you put inside? Huh? Did you use salt? Nice salt. Mix the salt. Mix the salt. What else is in there? Soup. Oh, it's soup. Mix it. It's delicious. Oops. Okay. So you'll notice that I'm just narrating what he's doing, right? For a toddler, really, I'm just narrating. I'm saying mixing. I'm using words like ingredients. Um, I'm using words like uh, mix and stir. 
Um, I'm asking him what it is that he's cooking. At this point, he's saying things like French toast and soup, which are things that he eats at home. Um, and now, this, this was taped, I think, uh, a few months ago, maybe like two months ago. And now he's using the word ingredients by himself on his own, right? Um, it's all about just modeling that language as they do it. What if you need a challenge? What if you have a child who's a preschooler or just ready to uh, take it to the next level? Try creating recipe sheets to follow uh, with the variety of materials and measurements. So on the left-hand side, you can see a mud pie recipe. And all it is really is just a number and a picture of whatever materials you're gonna use. Um, and encourage your child to use that particular recipe sheet to make their mud pie. That way they are um, uh, using number recognition, they're using counting, they're, they're uh, using, you know, beginning print recognition, um, and they're following directions. So this is a nice way to, um, to take it to the next level. Also, I just wanted to add the, the picture all the way to the right-hand side of, of my son in a blue jacket. That was before we had a mud kitchen. So you really don't need one to, to play in the mud. All that is really is a big uh, flower pot with some dirt in it and the, uh, the drain on our house above it was leaking. <laughs> so there was a lot of water in there. So no resources, no problem. We got a lot of mud. And uh, that's how we began making our mud pies and we just kept building on it. So I would suggest this for sure. Nature art with loose parts. This is one of Cindy's favorite. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a really nice way to foster creativity, explore nature, um, inventive thinking and attending to a task. Um, and it's really a nice, nice way to utilize the materials and then utilize them in a completely different way when you're all done. So what do you need? You need sticks, leaves, buds, flowers, and a surface to work on. So you'll notice that my surface is my, my dirty garage floor. There's no filters here, right? <laughs> this is just a mom trying to get through. Um, uh, so you collect the leaves with your, your, your child and the sticks and the flowers and the buds from outside and you talk about what you're creating and what you're what you're collecting and then you say we're going to create a big tree together with the sticks and we talk about what a tree might look like how many branches would you like to put on um, what should the, um, the trunk look like how tall should it be right um, and then you begin to add your natural materials so you decorate it essentially with the buds and the leaves and the flowers that you've collected and when you're all done you can you know, essentially mess it up and try it again, right? You can create a, a tree any way you want with however many branches you'd like. Um, and again, you're fostering that language. So you might say, hey, let's make a tree with two branches this time and have them make two branches and count them. Hey, let's make a tree with four branches this time. And now they're making it with four. So they're doing some number, uh, number recognition, making a connection to, from numeral to number and making that connection uh, to uh, the amount, right? For some people, you might need a whoops, whoops. You might need a challenge, right? So you can make some dice. How do you make dice? Well, grab any box or tissue box in your house. Tissue boxes work wonderful. Um, wrap it with paper and draw pictures or or tape on the actual materials that you've collected. So a bud, a leaf, a flower, um, whatever it is that you've collected. Put them on each side of the uh, the dice that you've cre created. Um, and for me, I like to add the word for print awareness. Can they actually read it? Maybe not, but at least it's there for them to see. Um, and then you roll the dice and place the corresponding natural object on your tree. So I roll the dice, it lands on flower. Okay, I'm going to add a flower. Let's try again, roll the dice, lands on bud. Great, let's add a bud this time, and so on and so forth. Um, you don't wanna create a dice, that's fine. You don't have a tissue box to create one, no problem. Use pick a card collect paper or index cards, and it's essentially the same, the same idea. Draw a picture or tape on the actual natural uh, object that, that you've collected, add the word for print awareness, so bud, flower, leaf, whatever it is that you've collected. Pick a card to determine how to direct, decorate your tree. Okay? It's a great way to uh, just up the ante a little bit and uh, foster that print awareness, following directions, um, uh, skills. Rock exploration. This was actually one of the first activities that we did um, when we were in quarantine. This is something that you can do for multiple days, 
Okay, so um, building on a child's interest and excitement by encouraging them to attend and revisit an activity or a topic um, is a really great skill to foster. Um, so you extend and revisit any of the activities um, if the interest and excitement is there. So we spent four days with rocks. So at JD's level, it was pretty simple. Day one, we collected uh, different sized rocks, right? He had a ball doing this. He actually wanted to do this again the second day, so we let him. Um, you can observe them, you can feel them, you can compare them, right? Um, use language to describe it. So that's where you as the adult um, uh, will, will come in. Um, so you'll say things like, what does it feel like? What does it look like? What, what color is it? That kind of thing. Um, I'm noticing that this one is smooth. I'm noticing that this one is rough, uh, so on and so forth. And then we uh, count how many were found, right? And then day two, we fill a bucket or a bathtub or a sink, whatever you have with soapy water and you scrub and wash the, dry, the rocks and then you dry them. This is a fun activity. And day three, we sort them. So you can see that I took a small container and a big container and uh, I wrote the words on it just for print awareness. Um, and I had JD sort them. Does your child enjoy, enjoy sorting? Take it to the next level, right? Sort by color or texture or shape. You can subsort. Um, hey, look at, look at all the small rocks. Let's see if we can find small white rocks. Let's see if we can find small brown rocks, right? Here's a video of sorting. Small. Big, good. So truth be told, I remember I told you my, my child is really energetic. I feared that that big rock was going to go through my window many times when we were sorting. Um, but thank goodness it, it didn't happen. Um, again, sorting is a great way to, um, to, to foster that classifying skill. Um, big, small, you can do colors, you can do shapes, that kind of thing. And of course, day four, we painted the rocks, right? We explored the creativity by painting some of the rocks. And then we kept a little to the side for a collection. So every time we went on a walk, we might collect a few more rocks and add it to the collection that we have in our house. Um, and whenever we want to revisit that skill of sorting or talking about the similarities and differences, we can, we can certainly do that. OK, ready to take some questions. Great. So we do have a few here. So the first one is, um, as teachers, how can we individualize within a classroom without making each child a funnel system? Uh, funnel system, how so? I don't know. What that, that question's from Diane. So Diane, if you could clarify, yeah, um, clarify your me. question by typing in the chat box, that would be great. Um, in the meantime, we can jump to the next question which is, can we use any dirt or soil for the mud kitchen or a specific type? This is for those of us who don't have a yard or, or dirt in their yard. Yes, you can, use, you can use any kind of dirt, anything, you know, potting soil is great, sand is fine, flour, <laughs> you know, baking flour you can use. Um, anything that's, that's pourable, mixable um, is, is absolutely fine. Okay, great. Yvonne? Um, yes. I might add to that, that if they're using potting soil to make sure that they use the organic one that does not contain any chemicals. Good call. If they're using something like sand, um, playground sand, um, the sanitary sand is excellent. And also the this, uh, this sand that is um, reduced dust for children that might have asthma. Right. They want to look at that. Yep. Okay, so Diane has clarified her question. Again, the original question, just to reference back, is as teachers, how can we individualize within a classroom without making each child a funnel system? And she says, we have to have the children play independent due to licensing regulations. All our toys need to be washed after every use. Right. So right, there's the, it's, there's a different it's a different uh, ball game now that we're we're dealing with you know, individual play. Um, 
you know, anything could be modified, right? So like if you are doing, is there a specific um, activity that they were looking at or is it anything in general, Diane? Diane, if you could. Uh, I just wanna make sure I'm, I'm answering it right. appropriately. She may be typing, so. Um, so, I, I mean, I think that it, she, if you're she, doing things like sorting, right? Oh, she said mainly the funnel system. I think the activity that you were creating. Oh, the fountain. Yeah. Okay, the fountain. <laughs> Got it. Um, uh, that's why I'm like, what's a funnel system? Okay. So, yes. Uh, well, you can have parents send in water bottles from their home, right? So, each child has their own. That's a, a way to kind of have, have it kind of separated. So, each child might have their own uh, uh, fountain that they might create. Um, or uh, in between play, they might wash it, right? Soapy soak for those, those fountains, those bottles. Um, that might be way, a nice way to clean them off and sanitize them for the next child. Um, I know things are a little different right now, so I guess those are some ways to get around it. Cindy, do you have any other ideas or anything that you want to chime in with? So I would definitely suggest family coming involved in the list of materials home to families that we're hoping they would send in for their children. I know many of the children will have individual bins, and then this just goes back into their bin after their use. Um, so it's not that we're closing down centers as much as we're making sure that everyone stays in their own space. But I would have something like that. Going. Right, so personalizing it really, right? So like sending in their own, their own uh, material, so a water bottle or whatever it is that you use. Great, so we have, um, it looks like just a comment here um, say, from Colleen saying, we placed some of our painted rocks around the neighborhood. So when we went on our nature walks, we would look for them. Also, the neighbors noticed the rocks on their proper property, um, the community the rocks built. Love that, that's great. Um, someone was asking if we'll share the um, PowerPoint afterwards. So um, we'll definitely share a recording of um, the session with you all and any other um, materials that um, Saban and Cindy would, would like us to share around, um, we'll certainly do that. Any other questions before we continue on? Great. Okay, here we go. So let's talk about beginning math, right? If you're looking to support math skills but don't know where to begin, it's simple as using items found around your home and just playing, right? I think that often we we put a lot of pressure on ourselves as parents and on ourselves as educators to uh, to teach specific skills and and um, teaching them that they need to learn how to eventually add and 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 there's a lot of pressure on us, right? Um, but really, it's as simple as playing and and exposing that educational language um, and exposing things that they might be interested in and turning it into some sort of math skill. So let me show you what I mean. This is called Count With Me. Um, most of us as parents or even as teachers in a preschool classroom have a million packages of wipes laying around and we go through them very quickly. Um, let's utilize what we have in the house, right? Or in our classrooms. Um, all I did was take off the uh, wipe tops. They're really sticky, but if they lose their stickiness, you can really use tape or glue or anything. And I put them on a shoebox. Um, on the top of those wipe container tops, I uh, decided I was going to go with color and number because JD wasn't really ready for number yet, but I wanted to just show, um, show you how to do it. Um, so I took tape, but you can use paper, you can use paint, whatever you have in the house to create color. And then on top of it, I put numbers. You'll notice that in the first picture, I have the number, I have a pip, which is a little dot to show the amount, and I have the word, the number, the numeral word written out, just so that there's exposure of all different kinds. Um, and what I did was I just poked holes, uh, corresponding amount, uh, to the number underneath the top, the white top. I happen to have straws. Remember in the beginning I said I was grasping for straws? I meant it quite literally. I happen to have straws and utilize them quite a bit um, with my activities with JD, and this is just one of them. Um, and they happen to be color, uh, multicolored straws. <clears throat> so I uh, put them in a cup, and I encourage JD to use his fine motor skills to flip open that 
cap, which is not an easy skill for a two-year-old to do. Um, it is pretty tight. Um, so he used his spine motor skills to flip open that top. top. Um, he looked at the color and was able to match the color and use one-to-one -one correspondence to put the amount of straws into the hole that matches the number. Um, he used hand-eye coordination. He was practicing color recognition, number recognition, counting. Um, and he revisits this pretty often. It sits in my living room and when he feels like it, he goes back to it. Um, this is also something that if your child or your student is a little higher level, you can create a few boxes and you can go up to however many numbers you'd like. Um, we just went up to four because that's all we were really able to do at this point. Um, again, if you're worried about, um, you know, uh, how to make this individual, this is another thing that, that parents could absolutely send in. Most parents are going to have these items in their house. Um, so even if they send you in the materials and you make it for them, you could, each child can essentially have their own box. <clears throat> Shapes. Um, I'm going to say, please disregard the big cooler on <laughs> the picture of my deck. Like I said, this is no filter. This is just a mom and a teacher showing you how I got by. <laughs> so please don't judge my, my cooler on my deck. Um, basically, we, we did some shapes. So all I used was colored tape and paper and post-its. So I chose two shapes this particular day, a rectangle and a triangle. Um, Again, these were words that JD did not know. And so I was really just introducing them to him. So I used my glass door um, and I used tape to make a rectangle and a triangle and I cut out those uh, corresponding shapes and put tape on them. Um, and then I modeled how to sort the shapes while using the correct uh, educational words. So um, I'm going to get a rectangle and I picked up the rectangle and I put it inside the big rectangle on the wall. I'm going to use a triangle, and I put the triangle inside the big triangle on the glass door. Um, eventually, we, we, we practice taking turns, right? So my turn, your turn, mommy's turn now, and I put it on, JD's turn now, and he put it on. And each time, I would model that educational language um, of the, shapes, the shape word. Um, and then we practice until all the shapes were gone. Uh, so they're learning things like shape identification, recognition, classifying, sorting, matching making a connection, attending to a task, and turn taking. Um, you don't need to use a glass lighting door. You can use a floor, you can use a wall, you can use a table. Um, where, whatever surface you have is fine. Um, truth be told, my two-year-old, he, he actually did this when he was one and a half um, or a little over, was not interested. And, and you know what, that's okay. He wasn't ready for it. And so I left it up. And what he did was we did it two or three times. And then he decided he wanted to take every pillow on my couch and pile it on the floor. But he did not pile it on the living room floor. He brought those pillows right in front of these shapes on my glass sliding door and piled them all there. And I thought, okay, he's interested. He just isn't ready to do this yet. So I built on it. I kept playing. And as I kept playing, I kept using that language. And he just sat there in his pile of pillows, watching and listening. And I left it up for a week and a half. And in that week and a half, he revisited it a few times. And he went and he played a few times and then he walked away. Um, now that he's a little over two, I think I'm gonna try it again and see if the interest is still there. Um, again, it's okay if they're not uh, interested in everything that you present, but um, the fact that you're modeling how to do it uh, is, is all that really matters. So because he wasn't interested in shapes that way, I knew I had to modify it and, and try to make it a little more simple for him. So really all I did was I took a piece of paper and he had buttons that were in shape form. So you can use buttons, you can use toys, puzzle pieces, uh, blocks, whatever you have that's, that's in, in different shapes. And I traced them onto a piece of paper. And then I took those buttons and I put them in a container. And I modeled for him how to match the corresponding button to the picture on the piece of paper. And while he did that, I used that language. Oh, uh, you know, I like the way you're putting the triangle on top of the triangle, let's find the circle, right? Um, and we took turns doing that. So let me show you how. Ma, 
toys. So, again, it was just the way that I modified it for him because it was just too stimulating the other way. And matching is half the battle. So I decided, you know what, let me work a little bit more on matching. Um, here's a really easy way to uh, practice those matching skills. Match shoes, right? Everyone has shoes in the house. Everyone has shoes, uh, you know, in the classroom. We're all wearing shoes. Um, you can learn sorting, classifying, matching, beginning patterns, creating a pair, uh, making connections, and for sure attending to a task. All you need is a variety of pairs of shoes. So all I did was line up uh, one shoe from each pair in a, in a nice street line, and then I placed the other shoes in a pile. And I just encouraged uh, him to find the match and match it up to the, to the shoe that's in the line, right? This is just the beginning skill of, of learning to, to sort and classify and make a match and create a pair, um, and even beginning patterning. So let me show you. Find the match. Where does the blue shoe go? Good job. Where does the black shoe go? Good job. Where does the slipper go? Find the match. Good job. And where does the flip-flop go? Find the match. you found it. So as you can see, I kept repeating, find the match, find the match, because match was a new word for him. Um, I'm utilizing that language to, uh, to, to create an educational and learning experience for him, as well as do something that he's having fun with, with materials that he sees every day, right? Um, so I'm not picking up flashcards or a worksheet. I'm picking up things that he knows about. Like he knows those are his shoes and my mommy's shoes and daddy's slippers. And he, he knows uh, that we need to put them together to, to make a match. Find them. Um, if matching is a, a, bit, a big hit, <laughs> there's other ways to do it. You can match with uh, utensils. So let me show you how. Big spoon. Make a match. Where is it? Find the other one. Put them together. Yay. Yay! Good. Little spoon. Make a match. Find the other one. Where is it? Find the little spoon. Yay! Fork. Where's the fork? Yay, good job, you made a match. So um, again, this was done back in March. Um, and at that time, uh, JD didn't know the word spoon, fork, match, uh, you know. So I was really pushing words like little spoon, little fork, make a match. Um, now he's utilizing those words on his own, just because that they were exposed to him, right? Um, again, I'm, I'm, that's why I say language is key. As the adult who's interacting with the child, whether it's a teacher or a parent or a grandparent or whatever it is, using that language to, to solidify what you're teaching them and how you're interacting with them is half the battle. Um, and again, it's, it's uh, materials that, that he knows, that he uses um, every day. Um, and we're just solidifying that skill of making a match. Okay, mystery box. Um, so basically, uh, all you need is a shoe box, the bottom half of a shoe box and some sort of cloth. Um, again, please disregard the dirty washcloth I use. <laughs> no filter, no resources, no problem. I used what I had. Um, and basically you just take a, a, a cloth of any sort. So whether it's a piece of a bed sheet or a t-shirt or a washcloth, or you, if you're creative and you wanna make it beautiful and lovely and nice, feel free. I'm not, so I did it this way. Um, and all I did was take that piece of washcloth, I cut a slit in it and I put rubber bands around it over the, the um, shoe box to make a box, basically a mystery box. Um, and what I did was I took three or four objects that he's used to dealing with, his fork, his car, and a pom-pom, right? And then I took pictures of them and I printed them out. Um, 
you can draw pictures of them if you're artistic, if that works for you. Whatever it is, it's a, a, a picture of the object. Um, and then I sh you show your, the child the, the different pictures and you place one of those objects inside the box. And you encourage the child to um, put their hand in, feel around, and try to use their sense of touch and their language to describe the item. So um, is it soft? Is it hard? Is it pointy? Is it smooth? Do you feel like it's round? Um, using the language and whether that means they're doing it on their own or you're prompting it, um, really fostering that language of describing what's inside. And then when they've described it, they pull it out or they guess what it is and then they pull it out. And once they pull it out, they can match it to the picture. Um, and by doing this, they're learning cognitive skills, language skills, curiosity and motivation, and, and matching skills once again. Now, this was a little bit too, uh, too high level for JD. He doesn't have the language or didn't have the language at that point to uh, tell me what it felt like or guess what it was. Plus, he didn't have the attention span to leave that item in the box without pulling it out. So if your child is not developmentally ready yet, like JD was, that's fine. You can modify it. So instead, you put the object inside the box and you encourage your child to put their hand in and feel inside and just simply remove the item, right? The excitement is still there. Um, and encourage them to match that item to the picture. And as the adult, your job is to model the descriptive language as they make the match. So, oh, it looks like you found a pom-pom. That's really soft and round, right? Let's make a match. Can you find the picture of the pom-pom, right? So you're just modifying it just a little bit so it's not as, um, as high level. And let me show you. Your hand in. Pom, 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 pom. Match it. So if that video would have gone on, um, it would have been me describing, yes, match it. That's a yellow pom pom. It's very soft. It feels very round. It can squish it. Things like that. Your hand in. All right. Ready for questions? If there are any. All right, so we have a lot of great comments coming in. Folks are sharing ideas um, and are really enjoying um, these creative ideas that you're sharing. Any questions that you'd like us to address specifically? Again, everyone's loving the ideas. <laughs> Good. Okay. And I'm glad people are supporting each other with other other ideas to go along with them. That's awesome. Absolutely. Any questions? Doesn't look like it. Okay. Well, we'll continue. Okay. So earlier on, uh, we talked a little bit about dice very briefly. Um, so I want to just go into that a little bit further with you um, on how to make dice an actual activity. Um, using dice to support uh, play and interactions is a really fun way to introduce new skills or even reinforce the familiar ones. Um, and your options are endless, really, and it can be based on your children's interest or in their preference, and it can be changed because uh, you can make as many as you want. Um, dice games can be uh, done independently or they can be done with other children once your children learns how to use them appropriately. In my house, uh, those dice will go flying across the room if I don't use them with JD. So for right now, it's kind of an adult, uh, adult and child activity. Uh, but eventually, as he learns to appropriately play with them, he will play with them on his own. Actually, just this morning, I saw one flying across the room as I was leaving the house. So um, anyway, let me show you what I mean. <laughs> Why isn't it going? Come on. Okay. So what do you need? Any type of cube or block or tissue box. I, I really think tissue boxes work the best just because they're lightweight and they're a nice size. Um, and you basically just wrap them with paper, right? Um, and you draw on each side what it is that you'd like the child to do. So um, for instance, if you look at the picture on the left side, you see three dice, a shape, color, and uh, gross motor dice. The shape and color one were store bought. They were great. Um, and you can do any type of activity with that. So roll the dice, name the shape, roll the dice, name the color, or roll the dice and find something of that color, match something of that color. The options are really endless. Um, the one that I created myself is just a gross motor prompt. 
So I put things like big steps, spin around, slither like a snake, fly like a bird, um, jump up and down, tiptoe. Um, uh, and uh, then they roll the dice and do do whatever it is that they that they need. Um, in the picture on the very uh, right hand side, it's just a small block. And as you can see, I just took a piece of lined paper and I am not an artist by any means. Um, I drew a picture of his favorite songs. So Itsy Bitsy Spider, Five Little Monkeys, ABC, and he rolls it and he sings the song. In the middle, we created a game. So for instance, roll the dice, the color, and then uh, I took a toilet paper tube and I attached it to my glass sliding door and he put the corresponding color pom-pom through the toilet paper tube and let it drop into, into a container. Um, there's lots of different skills that can be learned through the dice game. Um, I have to rush through this quickly because we're almost at time. So uh, let me go through fine motor practice quickly. Um, a lot of people say, well, how do I get pre-writing skills, right? How, how do I strengthen the muscles uh, in the fingers and hands? And, and really, it's not putting a pencil on a child's hand and telling them to write. There are ways to practice fine motor skills to get your child ready to write, cut, um, and button, and zip, and snap. And let me quickly show you how. Colander play. Most people have colanders at home, right? Um, all you have to do is take a colander, get some pipe cleaners, and encourage your child to put the pipe cleaners in the holes. Um, Problem solving skills come into play uh, because sometimes those, flex, those uh, pipe cleaners are a little too flexible and they need to learn to hold it at the very tip to put it in the hole. Um, and they really are kind of very fun at the very end to put on as a hat or to use um, in pretend play in the kitchen. No pipe cleaners, no problem. Most people have sippy cups or bottles at home that they've used and with those come flexible sippy cup and de cleaners. They work really well if you don't have pipe cleaners. Um, because they're flexible and uh, they can move around. Also, uh, flowers and flower stems. You can utilize those to uh, practice your phone fine motor skills and make a really beautiful bouquet. Small item pickup. Um, practice those fine motor skills, turn taking, early math skills, and intending and engaging just by encouraging your child to pick up pom poms and small objects. You can use tweezers or um, uh, kitchen tongs, clothespins. Um, all you have to do is cut a plastic bottle in half, um, get whatever object that you're going to put, uh, pick up. So it could be cotton balls, pom-poms, rolled up tissue, dry beans, whatever it is that you have in the house that's small enough to pick up. Um, and encourage your child to utilize the, the tweezers or the, um, uh, um, sorry, the clothespins or the kitchen tongs to pick them up and put them inside that small hole. Um, JD wasn't ready for that. His, his hands were not ready for it. So he just utilized his fingers. And if you um, encourage the child to use their pointer and their thumb to pick up those small items rather than fist grip, they're still utilizing those muscles to, um, to, build, to build strength. So let me quickly show you what I mean. Okay. So that's, uh, that's that. Twist the top. Most of us have uh, yogurt pouches or fruit, fruit puree pouches um, at home. All you need to do is take off those, like cut off those tops, um, wash them off really well and get a box, whether it's a shoe box, a small box, whatever it is that you have, and stick a hole in it and put those caps in. I encourage your child to twist them on and off. It really works those muscles um, and gets them ready to, um, you know, hold a pencil, zip, cut, the button snaps. And that is that. No resources, no problem. When in doubt, look around your home. There's likely something you can use to entertain and teach your children. Take the pressure off yourself and remember that playing, take, talking, interacting, and reading is the most important part um, and have fun. And if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. I just um, switched over my Instagram handle to at the play at home mom. I don't have a lot posted yet, but I plan on switching over a lot of these interactions on there. So feel free to follow me. Um, and eventually I will get them all switched over um, and available for you.
Thank you so much. Um, so I know we're at the, you know, a little over the 130 mark. Um, that being said, if anyone has any final questions, you know, we're, we're happy to stay on for another couple of moments. Um, we just want to be mindful of everyone's time. Um, and again, feel free to, to type in any final questions that you might have. Um, again, thank you to Sivan for putting on this wonderful session. We've gotten such positive feedback and idea sharing going in the chat, so it's really been great. And another special thank you to Cindy who uh, made this all possible. So I'd like to extend a huge thank you to, to you both. And Cindy, if you have anything else to add, feel free to jump in. Um, seeing some stuff come through the, the chat, just um, lots of folks saying thank you. And Jenna, thank you for giving us the opportunity to collaborate with the Alumni Association. And um, also, if people signed on with their phone numbers, I may not know who they are for professional development certificates if they need them. So if you did come on with your iPhone, you may want to send me an email. I'll put my email in the chat below so that I will know who you are. And I also put our WP Early Childhood um, community website up, not our website, our Facebook page for anyone who's interested in joining us.